All right, we're going to take a look at viruses, bacteria, and protists together. Um, we're going to look at it all as um, they're separate, separate groups, but um, we're going to group them together because um, they're all very simple organisms. So first looking at a virus, um, just the basic structure of a virus, it, it really only has two things going on. It's got its DNA, um, it could be DNA or RNA, and then it's got a protein coat. Um, the name of that protein coat is called a capsid. Um, and it's just the surrounding of the virus, and it's really the only two structures that the virus has going on. Um, it just delivers, it basically goes around and then is able to deliver its DNA into another cell, and then take that cell over and use it to make more viruses. So let's look at how that happens. Um, so there's basically, I just broke it down into three steps. Um, first thing the virus is going to do, it's going to eliminate the host cell's DNA. Um, it's either going to eliminate it completely or it's going to um, uh, inject its own DNA into whatever cell it's taking over. And they can take over bacteria, um, they can take over um, eukaryotic cells as well. So after it takes over, then the second thing it's going to do, it's going to use um, the host cell to make copies of its DNA and to make proteins. So basically it's just going to um, take over the ribosomes and the machinery of the cell and use it like a factory to just build viruses. Um, and then the third step is once it's built the viruses and they're, they're, they've been put together and assembled, the cell's going to burst. Um, it's going to release hundreds of those newly formed virus particles um, throughout. If it's inside your body, then it would release it in your body. And then those viruses can go take over new cells. Um, or if it's taking over bacteria, um, it's going to go, go and attach to new bacteria. Um, so let's look at another type of, so you might have heard of HIV as a, a retrovirus. So how does HIV work? Um, the difference between a retrovirus and a regular virus is that um, its information is going to go from RNA to DNA instead of DNA to RNA. That's the only, the retro part of retrovirus just means that it goes RNA to DNA. Um, so how does that make it different? Um, it's uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do its RNA first. The RNA is going to get translated into a DNA code that's going to get inserted into um, the host's DNA. And then once inserted into the host's DNA, it can stay there for a while. So that's why someone could have HIV um, and not AIDS. Uh, HIV is going to, the, the, or that, that virus DNA is going to stay inside of the host, inside of host cells for a while. And then once it starts replicating, um, what makes it really dangerous, what people die from uh, when they have AIDS, is uh, immune system deficiency. So what happens is they usually end up dying from something like pneumonia or um, some other cold or virus. Because what HIV does is once it's replicated, it just goes out and it starts attacking white blood cells and diminishes the, um, the host's ability to fight uh, infection. Um, so it's going to damage the host immune system. And if you want to look in detail, this is a much more detailed um, uh, image and description of how HIV is going to replicate within a host cell. Um, so let's look at the idea of are viruses living? Um, viruses are not considered living things for a, a couple of reasons. Um, they don't grow and develop. They don't obtain their own energy. They don't respond to their environment. Um, they do have RNA or DNA, so they have a genetic code, um, but basically they don't, um, they can't do any of those processes on their own, so they're not considered living. The only um, way that they can make those things happen is by taking over a host cell. Uh, so now we're going to move from viruses um, to bacteria. Bacteria are basically going to be divided into two groups. You have archaebacteria, um, those are the ones that live in extreme en environments. And they're thought to be the oldest living things on Earth, the only living things that could have possibly tolerated early conditions of Earth. And then the second group is bacteria. Um, it's the larger of the two. Um, and bacteria are basically, they're single-celled forms of life. Um, they have some sort of cell wall uh, made of peptidoglycan. They have a cell membrane, circular DNA, and they've got ribosomes for making protein. Uh, so some of those things they have in common with um, eukaryotic cells in the cells in your own body, like a cell membrane and ribosomes. Um, their DNA structure is different. Um, it's just a circular strand. Um, and you can look over here, we got an example of a bacterial cell 
um, and how it's laid out. Some of them have uh, flagella for movement, so some bacteria can, can move around um, to get to uh, a different environment that uh, is more suitable for them. So bacteria come in three basic shapes, um, bacilli, uh, cocci, and spirilla. Um, so those three shapes, if you've ever gone to uh, the doctor and if you've ever gotten strep throat, um, it's called streptococcus, and that's because it's this circular shape. So usually bacteria are come in two names, and the shape of the bacteria is part of that name. Um, some bacteria also have flagella for movement, um, like I said before. So you can see the bacterial flagellum right here. Um, it's how they move to get around. Um, <clears throat> so I want to look at how bacteria grow and change. Um, so first thing I'm going to talk about is if bacteria are in an environment that is not suitable for them to live in, if they don't have food or um, uh, nutrients, they can form this thing called an endospore. And basically what it is, it's like a little capsule um, that allows them to stay in the area. It keeps their genetic material uh, intact. Um, and it's almost like a seed in a plant, right? Um, that endospore allows them to kind of sit. They could be on a tabletop just sitting and waiting for conditions to be right. And then if water and a food source gets in that area, boom, they can um, trigger them to grow back their um, cell membrane, cell wall, and uh, start functioning like a normal bacteria. So that's if conditions are unfavorable. If things are um, favorable and they have a food source, they're going to divide by a process called binary fission. Um, it's how they reproduce. So they double their DNA and then they divide their cell. Um, it's almost like um, it's almost like mitosis in a cell, um, but that's their way of reproduction, and it's called binary fission. And then there's one other cool thing that bacteria can do, um, and it's the reason that bacteria can um, respond so quickly to things like antibiotics or um, hand sanitizer. Uh, it's really the reason why there's certain strains of bacteria that are resistant to that, and it's called conjugation. So even though bacteria don't, you know, they don't find a mate like humans or most animals do and then uh, reproduce that way, bacteria can share DNA, um, and they, they share their DNA, DNA in a thing called a plasmid. Um, so what they do is they form this um, pilus that they can use to pass information between the two bacteria. They attach and they uh, send over a plasmid, which is a section of their DNA. It could just be a single gene or part of a gene. Um, they send that plasmid over, it gets copied, and um, it's inserted and it's a part of the new bacterial cell's DNA. Um, and that bacteria can take on that new gene. Um, and if it's a resistance to a certain antibiotic, they can use that plasmid um, and they're going to pass it on to uh, when, they, um, when they undergo binary fission. They'll replicate that plasmid and pass it on to all the copies. Um, and then the last group we're going to talk about today is protists. Uh, I put a picture there of diatoms. They're a type of protist. I think it's super cool. They come in all these really neat shapes and they have a, um, basically it's like a glass shell around them and all kinds of different variations. Um, protists were the first eukaryotic organisms, so the first ones that would have transitioned from being sing simple bacterial cells to being um, unicellular but eukaryotic cells. Um, some protists are even can be even multicellular. Um, protists basically don't fit into any other kingdom. Um, they're very unique in uh, that they have a variety of ways of living. Um, they can be like plants, and they can be like animals, and they can even be like funguses, uh, but they don't fit into any of those groups. Um, protists have three different ways of moving. They can have cilia, um, this is the central picture right here, which is tiny little hairs coming off the side of that uh, protist. They can have flagella, just like a bacteria can have. Um, uh, so that flagella is going to help them move through their environment. And the very last thing is if they're like an amoeba, um, they can extend little projections of their body. Um, it's called a pseudopod, and it's a Greek word that means false foot. 
So amoeba can actually extend their body out and kind of creep along um, to move along in their environment. And um, I've got a really kind of complex, more complex than it needs to be diagram, but it shows a bunch of different type of protists um, and shows their, um, their lifestyles and the way that they live in their environment. They can be autotrophs, they can be heterotrophs, they can form symbiotic relationships, um, they can also be mutualists and parasites, so all different kinds of living styles. Alright, and that's the end for today.